if, if Favreau was here, we would all be talking about Favreau and his world. <laughs> So what I don't want to do for, for the dinner, dinner for five that I'm hosting, I want to talk about you guys. But well, you're that, more colorful. Not more colorful at all. We got a guy here who's created half of the popular shows on I television. I know. If, 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 out if this guy gets sick, ABC shuts down. ABC, ABC is what called now the Abrams Broadcasting yeah, yeah, yeah. Company, because <laughs> you've got two and you're making Very another good. one. There are menus. What's the What is the new show? You're not allowed to talk about it, are you? The, the new, the, Thank it's, you. it's 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 just you know. These yeah. are non-disclosure agreements, by the way, not menus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Basically, this time it's about a spy who gets lost. Because uh, <laughs> both shows work so well, you like them. Sorry. No, the, 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 there's uh, we're actually uh, we're, there are three different pilots that we're working on. I I I, I wrote one of them with this guy John Eisendrath, and it's uh, it's a, it's a PI show. It's it's so old school this show. Right. It's the first show that I I've written that feels like a show, but I don't you know what I mean. You just don't know what's going to work, what's not going to work. Why do you keep creating shows? Are you just power and money hungry, or do you have to do it, uh, or do you feel the need? Are you creatively driven? What drives you? What drives a J.J. Abrams? I think just the power. No, I, uh, <laughs> it, it's fun. It's a, it's a fun medium. The speed of it, the, you know, the, the, the idea that you can sort of come up with something, write it, you know, cast it, shoot it, and it's on the air, and millions of people have seen it within seven or eight weeks. It's just, it's crazy. It's like you get so used to that that it's sort of, that's part of the fun of it, you know. And you can't write every episode. Oh, no. I mean, you know, the Damon Lindelof, who created You Lost don't me, write every know. episode? That's no, time to go because we all were under the mistake I'm assumption sorry. you write every episode. No, no, uh, hardly. No, we, we, you know, we have incredible writers who work on these shows, and a lot of times people say, "Oh, you know, your show, your idea. Oh, how did you do that?" It's, you know, and there are people who come up with all the good ideas, and and you know, it's it's hardly. How many fair, writers you know? per for one of those shows? Nine or ten, you know, uh, for each show, and nine or ten writers per show. Yeah. So you know, I actually feel guilty when. Uh, something you know goes, uh, airs and, and there's a, either a critical thing or anecdotally or even online you know you look at the, the boards and people are like oh you know that's amazing you know what JJ did and it's just it's it's not it's not me so much of the time mm -hmm. that I always take the the blame when something goes wrong you right. know there were a lot of complaints as that, well you should well yeah but like season three of Alias there were a lot of people who felt we went off track and so you know all the people who are just you know kissing your ass and going, oh, that's the greatest thing of all time, or suddenly, like, you know, you get these letters that they want to kill you. They're, they're, they're furious, and yeah. they think that you suck. So, so you got my letters. You got my letters. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> they're doing this movie with Jennifer Garner called Catch and Release over at Sony or something like oh. that. And it's Jennifer Garner and Timothy Oliphant are, like, love interest. And then there's a third lead and they called up, and Jenna was just like, we want you to come in and read for that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't like act. I, you know, I do this, on, you know, and make faces and shit in movies. And I had to, like, audition. I've never really been on that side of the table or camera. So I went in, did it, and then felt like any chance I had at this, I lost. Which was cool because I've been, you know, I, there are three chicks in the room, right? There's Susanna Grant, there's Jenna Topping, there's Bruce, and there's Deb Aquila, who's the the casting director. And it's, would, it wouldn't be the first time that I've been rejected by a woman, or even three. So <laughs> I'm, I, can deal yeah. with, I can deal with it. And then I got a call from my agent going, they just called, you got it. So I was like, I got, I got I'm, this is the weirdest thing in so my life. So you got this part? I got the part. Hey, congratulations. It's very That's sweet. Huge. What's, wow. the, what's the part? The part is like, I'm the, I'm the fat friend. So I got to put on some pounds. <laughs> Uh, it's just the friend, it's the buddy who, like, the, her, her, the, the idea of the story is that she was engaged to a dude who uh, gets killed right before the movie begins and uh, how everyone deals with this dude's loss. But it's comedy drama. Like, it's, it's, I love it because it's a movie about grief. I love movies about grief. But it's got some comedic stuff built into it. I read it. it. You read it? Yeah. This is the other reason why I wanted to bring it up because it's the past that you, the part you passed on, the yeah. Sam part. You passed on it? I pass and you get it. I did.
Why didn't you do that for like the, the, the Incredibles? Why didn't you pass on Syndrome? <laughs> and then I could have been Syndrome. It's terrifying. Uh, auditioning is the worst thing uh, you, you can go through as an actor. It's miserable. What do you hate about auditioning? You don't get, they don't really get a chance to know who you are. Like once you get the job, you're on the set, you're rehearsing, you're gonna screw up a dozen times until, the, until you find it. And you find it because of the director. Right. right. So I understand that you're either right for something or you're not if you don't get it. Most of the time it's because you're not right for something. You're too tall, you're too short, you're just not the right vibe overall. But I almost try a little too hard when I audition. I, I try to buddy up to the guy. and I'm really into this, I'm into that, because I want a better shot at getting the part. So the I think they the more they you. know me, yeah. maybe they'll give me the part. Yeah. Maybe, they, maybe they'll think I'm suddenly right if they thought at first I was wrong. Did you do that when you went it in? It worked on me. Because yeah. when we were auditioning uh, for Mallrats, and that's where I met Jason, we didn't know anybody out here. And we were auditioning out here over at Universal. And he was one of the guys that came in. And the only one who came in without an air of pretension about him, no actor type bullshit about him. And when all was said and done, his reading of the TS part wasn't that great. But we just liked him, just sitting there talking to him. So the casting agent was Don Phillips, and Don was just like, uh, what do you guys think? And I was like, I don't think he's right, but bring him back. Why didn't you think he was him. right? Um, it just, he wasn't right for that part, it, it, it for the T.S. part. It was part. absolutely it was the part that Jeremy terrible London got. reading uh, of it wasn't, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't you. And it wasn't until we got to the Brody stage of the game where I was like, oh my God, this could totally work. But we brought you back, do you remember, like three times? Oh, yeah. Each I, time, just going like, Don Phillips would come in going like, what do you, what do you think? Should we bring him back? I said, yeah, bring him back. He's like, do you like him? We're like, not, not as an actor, but he's a good guy to talk to. <laughs> Fuck you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> you he's a terrible actor, actor but he's pretty funny. <laughs> and then it worked out. And then, yeah. like, by the time we got to, like, the, the fourth or fifth audition, it was just like, oh, my God. He's, not only is he a good guy to sit there and chit-chat with, but he's also an ace. Like, he'll be able to pull Brody off. And you took it and ran with it yeah. in a big, bad way. Yeah, I, I talk about nerve-wracking. I mean, I, went, I, I hadn't acted before. I hadn't done anything. I was a pro skateboarder. I didn't, you know what I mean? I was still riding a skateboard. And, and I even, I kissed a little ass, too. I, I had a Jason Lee pro signature shoe out, <laughs> skateboarding shoe. And I brought uh, a bunch of pairs of that to Kevin and Scott Mosier, producer Don wheel. Phillips, thinking that that would wow. be, that's that me trying really hard to brown nose. Back in the day when you guys were selling comic books, mm -hmm. um, how many, what was the, what, was, what did an average comic book ship? What how many ship? did it sell? Yeah, like just for one issue. Ship 200,000 and sell 100? No, I think more than that actually. Yeah, 500,000 was not uncommon. Really? Mm -hmm. So what was like a best selling comic book? Or did they even gauge it like that? Because there were no specialty stores back in the day. It was all newsstand, right? Nobody knew what the best sellers were. Nobody kept good rec. I mean, it was the most casual business you could ever imagine. Right. To and me, you guys didn't, and you didn't even realize you were creating legends and the myths of no. the 20th century, stuff that would carry on. We and, hoped that the books would sell so we'd keep our jobs and we wouldn't get fired and we'd be able to support our families. And you had a really a, a captivated audience, right? Mm -hmm. Like, back in the day, kids had comics before there was even TV as a distraction or cable or VHS or the, uh, the DVD player or but the thing pornography is, or crack like I basically you had kids I was embarrassed to be doing comics I would go to a party somebody would say what do you do you know at a party I'm a writer and I'd try to walk away before yeah. they'd pin me down <laughs> but they'd follow me what do you write oh um children's books and I'd walk faster but they'd follow me what kind of children's books well at some point I had Idols, to say comic please. books yeah. and they would turn around I'd never see him again. There was of so course, today it's different. Yeah, Even it's different. kids who are insanely young nowadays, there's a kid in my daughter's class who mm -hmm. like knows who Stan Lee is. Mm -hmm. Like Stan Lee is the Spider-Man's dad, is the Hulk's dad, is, is X-Men's dad. Like, well, Stan made himself into a character. It's like the way Walt Disney used to introduce the Disneyland mm -hmm. show and you mm -hmm. felt you right. got to know him. He put real personality you know, it gave people nicknames and established a real rapport with the reader. And like I say, I was just at that stage where I should have been giving them up, at least I thought. And I thought, wow, this is exactly the kind of sense of humor and the sort of irreverence that the more staid DC comics never had, you know. Funny thing is, I was friendly with the guy who did the DC comics. His name was Carmine Infantino. Mm -hmm. He's still around. 
great guy. Never quite understood. I, for example, I know our books were began to outsell theirs, mm -hmm. and I had friends who worked at DC, and they would tell me they would have meetings, and they would say, "Why the hell are the Marvel books outselling ours?" And you know, I think it's because they have a lot of dialogue balloons on the covers. So they would put a lot of dialogue balloons on their covers. The minute I heard that, I took all the balloons off our covers. Right. Then they would say, because Stan uses a lot of red on the covers. The minute I heard that, I took all the red off our covers. I mean, it must have driven them crazy. It had nothing to do with anything except we were putting personality in our books mm -hmm. and we were talking to the reader like you yeah. we fooled you you thought we were talking to you yeah. <laughs> yeah. and they weren't speaking of tv shows did you see that you and i online are, are supposed to be doing a star wars tv show i've been asked about that so many so times. so by what do you on. say i just keep saying maybe I just keep, you know, misleading. Because I'm hoping that if I keep saying maybe what sooner or later, there's this rampant online rumor that there's going to be a Star Wars TV show that takes place between the first trilogy and the second <laughs> trilogy. It's essentially like off the Bible stories. Right. And that I'm, I'm, uh, I've been hired to write the show. And he's he's gonna come back and play older oh, Luke Skywalker wonderful. in the show. Well, listen, all I you've ever been asked a zillion times. A zillion times. I've been to and me I too. And I just go, oh, I'd love to work with Kevin again, but I haven't heard anything about it. And I just keep ducking the question, going like, I I read that online too, because I'm hoping like sooner or later, George Lucas is gonna be like, well, I guess we should do it. <laughs> <laughs> do you look at the Hayden Christensen arc of of uh, the new trilogy, trilogy? and see him, like now he's, obviously in Sith, he goes full board to the dark side. Yeah. And you and I talked about this once. Do you like sit there going like, man, in Return of the Jedi, that should have been me. I should have been the I dude. I pitched that to George. Did totally, you really? Yeah. So did you want to, in the last one, in Jedi, just go <coughs> nuts? No, as an actor, that would be more fun to play. I just thought that's the way it was going. From when we finished two, I figured that's what will be the pivotal moment. I'll have to come back. But it'll be like I'll have Han Solo in my crosshairs and I'll be about to kill him or about to kill the princess or about to kill somebody that we care about. And, you know, it'll be, a, you know, it's an old cornball movie, like World War II movies and stuff. And I was the one that said to George, you know, because I live in Japan, I said I should come back having been trained somewhere with shaved widow's peak and a top knot, and like a braid. He said, no, I want your hair to look exactly like it did in the other two. <laughs> you know, he, and then he, then of course, what do I see? Anakin Skywalker got himself sure, braided, looking a little sure. Asian and whatnot. But he drives you crazy, because I remember we did this, you know, with the stunt guy, and Peter Diamond was the stunt guy, and uh, we did this choreographed thing, and George came to look at it after, I don't know, four weeks of doing it. Peter and I worked out a couple of moves where we would spin around and have just one hand, because George had said, they're heavy, like Excalibur. Right. You can't take a hand, it's too heavy, and drop. And we begged him, because you could get a lot more variations on moves, and it's a much more visually interesting fight if you don't have to constantly have to, you know, he was adamant. I mean, he can be, he can really dig in. Lots of times you'll say, can, instead of saying this, can I just do this? You know, yeah, all right. Or as Harrison said, don't even tip him off, just do it the way you want to do it if he, if he notices then. Oh yeah, okay. Because I'd always go, George, can I say no? And Harrison would just do it. All right. Does it bug you? Does Star Wars talk about Star Wars ever bug you? To be honest with you, well yeah. sure, I'm human. I mean, I like ice cream, but I don't eat it three times a day. Right. And I've forgotten a lot of it, you know? I right. mean, if I were still working on it, it might be different. But I put it in perspective and I just, you know, I want to be supportive without being critical, but, you know, it's not mine anymore. He wrote regarding Henry. <laughs> I, Did I, you really? Yes, and I love oh, that, that movie so a, much. That was Harrison Ford, Thank like you, as, as a dude who you know has to communicate via Ritz boxes for like the first twenty minutes <laughs> of the movie, I'm I'm so there. How does that happen? I was in uh, college. It was my senior year, and I realized I'm graduating in you know six months. I'm screwed. I was back in L.A. and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, and I ran into this uh, uh, young woman who I knew. Uh, Jill Mazursky, who's Paul Mazursky's daughter, mm -hmm. and she had sold some stuff since she graduated college. Mm. And 
we just started talking about stuff and I just said, we should write something together, like desperately hoping that like I could be doing what she was doing. And so we did over that Christmas break and we wrote a treatment. And her father, who was working at Disney at the time, uh, gave it to Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was also working at Disney at the time. And he bought it. So during my senior year of college, I was lucky enough to sell wow. my first thing, which is, you know, impossible. But I kept feeling like, this is it. And so I, I scrambled to like write another script while we were waiting to see if that one would get made. We wrote, right. started working on a, this idea that I'd actually played around with a little bit in college. I'd written a bunch of, I wrote a script, screenplay called Regarding Henry in College that was a very different story, but I like the title. You love the title. It's a good title. title. Thanks. And like, you know, uh, I love the ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So I had the ordinary people script with me the whole time while I was writing uh, Regarding Henry, just to reference it, because there was something about that script that was, you know, they just felt like movies. It just felt like the real deal, and it was just inspiring. So I'd like, you know, just keep referencing it, just kind of like remember that feeling of, of, a, of a great movie desperately trying to emulate that, you know, and, and ultimately, obviously, not coming close to that, but writing a script that I thought, you know, it, I was proud of it because I finished it, you know what I mean? Because uh, there are a lot that I hadn't. And I gave it to uh, my agent, and I said, look, I don't know, you know, let's see what happened. Within a week, it was like, while we were still waiting for that other movie to get made, <clears throat> I got this call that, uh, that Mike Nichols wanted to direct this movie, and Harrison Ford was going to star in it. Wow. Mike Nichols. It was nuts, my. you know, and... You must have uh, thought you were dreaming. It was impossible. I mean, it, it was just ridiculous. Because I was a kid. I was like, whatever, 21, 22. Right. They say, we want, we want you to fly to New York to, to meet with, with Mike and Harrison. And I, you know, and of course, uh, I was thrilled and, and terrified. And, and I went to New York. Right. And I go in, and I, I meet with Mike in his office. And there's Mike, you know, and there's Harrison. And I didn't know who to be more... <laughs> Freaked out with? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I kiss their asses equally. My daughter, you know, who's five, she'll be in bed and, you, you know, you can say goodnight, and then she's like, you know, Daddy, like, yeah, what's going on? She's like, Syndrome scares me. <laughs> like, out of the blue. Like, yeah, like we hadn't watched The Incredibles for a couple, you know, hours. Did you see The Incredibles? Yeah, sure. Jason played the villain, Syndrome. the voice of Syndrome, Syndrome. the bad guy. Well, you That's were right. the one. A nice guy like you. You have to leave a message for her on my phone or something that says, I'm not yeah, a scary well, guy. I, well, I, that is I did that. That's you did, yeah. you get, do you, how often do you get that now? Because now you're of an age where a lot of your friends must have when kids. It hit on D, when the DVD came out, holy shit. Really? I, had no, I, I thought for sure, you know, you do a voice in an, a Pixar movie, it's going to be... You know, your friends, a few people might recognize you. But Are you high? Been, no, on, I, just because it's the voice. There ain't a person here who wouldn't do, kill to do a voice in a Pixar movie. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm yeah. saying in terms of recognition. For yeah, it. before that, too. For, I mean, it's like and the mark of quality. Let me ask you, what you I'm get. saying is you're in a movie, they see you. Right. So they go, oh, you were in such and such you didn't movie. Think but just hearing the you voice. You didn't think the voice. Oh, so you have a very distinctive voice, though, too. People recognize your voice? But out of the blue, they'll say, wait, were you Syndrome? No, or yeah, or no, they'll say, oh, you, you know, The Incredibles, I love that movie. Right. Great, you know, good job. How many days did you work on it? Uh, four days. That's all? For all that, four days. Four How days, did you about get the assignment? I mean, I would think there must have been a thousand actors trying for it. I guess what they do is they... You bought some shoes for the people. They, yeah, exactly. I, brought, I did some skateboarding tricks for them. Wow, I think... They cut great. together a dialogue from, from existing movies. What and was? they listen to it and they... Gee, what, one, what movies were those, Jason? Dogma. Lee? Really? Dogma, I've seen. I've heard this very fine picture. Uh, yeah, because I, I got to be... You know, I was really big and animated and dogma and kind of evil. And, and uh, so they, they cut together some, some excerpts from that and, and they literally look at the drawings and listen to the voice. And did you know what your character looked like when you were reading? Yeah, I basically had a big uh, oh, I'm sure they showed you cork pictures. board yeah. with some photos and that was it. And how close was it to the final character at that point? Because it it's it, early on that you recorded yeah. the voice before, like almost two, three years ago. I remember at one point you were saying, yeah. hey, I just did a voice for Were they four consecutive cartoon. days or was it like split up over months? Over maybe four or five, six months. Did they videotape you when you were doing it? Yeah. Cool. They did a making of the Batman movie, and when I saw what I looked like, it was very much like this, with the cameras really subliminal, so you're, you're tuning them out. And for Joker, I stand up, because it really energizes the voice. And when I saw the film on HBO, I was, that's really embarrassing. <laughs> like, Bleh. Yeah, I mean, it's I, there's so spit over the flying top. out of my mouth, yeah. and there's nine microphones, and I'm but and you I make lost choices my voice. you'd never do if you knew you could be seen. Somebody at Marvel got an idea for publicity. We were going to do the Kiss comic book, and we wanted to play it up. So they decided 
each member of KISS, all four of them, would take a little bit of their blood and drop it in the printer's ink so that everybody who bought that comic book would feel we're getting a little bit of the KISS blood in this book. It's printed with their blood, so to speak. We chartered a plane, KISS and me. We flew up to Buffalo, where the printer was. When we got off the plane, there was a police escort, and there were cops in the street stopping traffic Your while we went by. And truly. All I could think of was, these idiots and me are going to put blood in a printer's ink to sell a comic. And we're stopping parents from picking up their kids in school, doctors who may be rushing to a patient. They've got to wait, because we're going to the printing plant. <laughs> I never got over that. It was a typical Americana, you know, American industry and public relations. So you do Alias for like one or two seasons, right? and you meet Tom Cruise, and you meet Steven Spielberg because of War of the Worlds, am I correct? Uh, they just were trying to figure out what to do, and they came to have this, they, we had this meeting, Spielberg and Tom Cruise and Paula Wagner, but it was one of those meetings where, you know, every time I looked anywhere, I just felt trapped. Like it was, it just, and I literally, during the meeting, I think stopped the meeting, I was like, this is really weird. I just had to say it, because it was like freaking me out too much to, to be in that meeting, but. And then uh, they were like, it gets weirder. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> But the brilliant thing is before the, this is, this is a, talk about a mega mega panned off right here. Like it's normally somebody leaves, you gave me a pair of sneakers, right? This dude, as they're leaving his office, no, he gives no, no. him alias. No, he see? gives Tom Cruise alias the box set. Tom Cruise watches it what, in two days? First of all, I didn't give it to him. I didn't even know he got it. Right. Uh, this woman who was working with me at the time, uh, Mary Beth, gave the two first two seasons to Tom. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know. So I'm in Hawaii months later. Uh, shooting the pilot for Lost, right. and I get this phone call that Tom Cruise called in my office, and I thought that's you know odd. So I call him back, and he's like, "Hey, you know, he's how you doing?" I'm like, "Good. What's up?" Like Tom Cruise, you know, and uh, he I says, "I admit that, that was actually me. I was pranking." <laughs> you were good, but that's kind of what I thought was going on. Like literally, you think, "Come on, what is yeah, going on?" Right. And he's like, "I watched every episode." We're like, "What?" He's like, "I watched all 44 episodes of Alias, the first two seasons." I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, can we, let's, you know, when you get back, let's, you know, hang out. <laughs> I was like, all right, you know. It's so weird, because I've never gotten that call in my life. It's going to happen soon. Never it? happened. No, but it's, it was like, that was what I felt like, like, huh? And so we did. I came back, and we, like, started dating, basically. Like, he'd send me, <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> and before uh, I knew it, we'd, like, become buddies. It was right. just, like, it was normal. And I get this phone call, and they're like, my agent's like, are you aware of the conversations? I was like, what were you talking about? Uh, about you directing Mission Impossible 3. And I was like, what? That's how Cruise works. It was so, it was. That's how Cruise works. But he that's gets what, into your life and then he's like, direct my movie. All of a sudden it happened. Uh, uh, that's what happened. And then, like you already directed that? No, he's, he's uh, coming up. Mission no, Impossible huge, 3. Big thing, man. Yeah, it's, it's insane. That was the movie that started everything for me because, like you said, Mallrats tanked and. Right. Thanks and for I, reminding me of that. Yeah, exactly. Well, you I've know, forgotten. I don't, I don't, <laughs> but it was Chasing Amy. I mean, even movies like Enemy of the State, I got that movie because of Chasing Amy, right. which was kind of odd. Oh, yeah, you were the guy who gets hit by the car? The fire yeah, truck, yeah. I didn't get anything because of mall rats, and we'll talk about that later. You, you Luckily, got a bad I mean, reputation because <laughs> of mall rats, and blacklist is I what you got. I got Chasing Amy from it, and I honestly, I don't know what I would have gotten had you not come along with Chasing Amy because, again... I don't know if you know this, but Mallrats didn't do very well when it came out. <laughs> I'd heard. I'd heard from a few people. No, it was This is something that no one else something. here will ever understand. Failure. You know, because you guys are nothing but I successes. Understood. Me and him the sat movie, there going the like... The movie failed on a kind of me. Yeah, it wasn't you, sir. They put you on the poster, which I always thought was really cool. <laughs> That's what That was happened. one of the minor achievements of my life, getting Stanley on the In a way, it probably poster. really helped Chasing Amy, because with the reverse, it's like the rock group that sells 
40 million albums and their follow-ups sell There's 6 that, million, no which is a great though. number, right. but it's no 40 million, and they never recover from that. Happened to Fleet Isn't it Mac, funny how that works? In the second album, they wagon. sell 30 million, and it's just not good enough because yeah. the first one did 40. And that equation only works if the, let's say your first album sold 10 copies, and then your second album sells three copies, because yeah. that was Clerks to Mallrats. Yeah. And then Chasing Amy was the one that kind of Well, that's what I mean. The pressure was off in yeah. a certain sense that you didn't have to reach a certain bench Benchmark to right. You know. It was. It was. I mean, actually, that was probably outside of Clerks, which was the most uh, artistically free period. Because I love nobody, thank you. I feel like Favreau when we made Swingers. <laughs> when we made. Uh, when we made, and you know what I'm talking about. When we. Uh, <laughs> when we made Clerks, it no, was really this out. just wonderfully artistically free period yeah. where there was no expectation because we thought well, nobody would see it except friends. Mallrats, there was a, more of a, an onus on the picture because you're like, well, we're making it for a studio and it's going to be released. We know this is getting released. Like Clerks, we never knew if yeah. it was getting released or not. So when that shit tanked, nobody gave, gave a shit about us anymore. And so Chasing Amy was almost like going back to that artistically free period where we were making the movie under the radar and nobody cared. Like nobody was like, hey, we can't wait to see what Chasing Amy's like because they're like saying thing like mall rats. But it's, it's so astonishingly original, Chasing Amy. In other words... It is, and it is. It's a romantic it, comedy. It's a romantic comedy, but it, it, it's not like it's... It, you, some movies you look at it and you, you can see the cynicism of putting together elements that are going to be commercial. Right. And it, at least if that's the way, what motivated you to come up with that, it, it didn't appear that way at all. If, you mean if I was trying to make a commercial flick, I failed miserably? Well, no. Because <laughs> I'd agree yeah, with you there. I was in the stupid little world. I was a comic book writer. And you and, want to be the great American novelist. Yeah, and there were people doing movies and television yeah. and Broadway theater. And I'm writing comic books. You don't even have to be in comics to actually have to play down comics. I mean, that, that's not anything that ever got me laid in high school. No. Where it's like, I read comic books. How would you like to say I wrote them? <laughs>